All right. Uh, welcome everyone to Astronomy on Tap. This is the fourth or the fifth edition uh, of Astronomy on Tap, uh, as we still cannot travel 260 miles to you uh, and bring you the content and the nice science. We have to deliver this on YouTube. So uh, today we, and starting from today, we have adapt, uh, adopted a new uh, format. So it's going to be a bit shorter because we will have only one talk. Uh, so it's you know adapted to uh, internet audiences and so you can do your things afterwards. Uh, I guess uh, some of you will be watching uh, the SpaceX launch, of course, and I'm told uh, that you will be able to see if the, if the launch actually happens, uh, because as you know, it's, it's, it depends on the weather conditions. Um, it will be actually visible from the UK. Uh, so at 9.50, uh, if you look at the south, uh, it will be moving from west to east. And you should see uh, two points because there will be the, the rocket and, and, the, and the capsule. Um, so tonight we have an exciting program uh, looking much uh, further than the ISS. Uh, we will be actually looking at stars and especially what happens to stars when they die. And basically that we're all made of stardust. And uh, Chiara will introduce uh, the speaker. Hi, everyone. Yeah, our speaker today is uh, Francisca Schmidt, also known as Franci. Hi, Franci. <laughs> She's a PhD student at UCL here in London, uh, and so she's working as a theoretical astrophysicist. But Francie, you told me that you had also an experience as a, an observational astronomer, and you went to a telescope at Hawaii um, to do an observing run, but something happened. <laughs> do you want to tell us what happened then? <laughs> Yeah, so as Chiara already said, so I don't do observations, so it's very uncommon for people like me to actually go to telescopes. And I was super excited when I got the chance to go to Hawaii to observe with, with JCMT. But I also was really, really scared because I thought, you know, being clumsy as I am and having no idea about observations, I'm sure going to press, I don't know, the blow up telescope button and destroy the whole world. So I was really, really trying not to make any mistakes, not to mess anything up. And I was doing quite well until the very, very last day. So on the very last day, the way it works, uh, you do your observations, you go back to the accommodations, you sleep a little bit, and then they give you a car to drive down to the city. And I got into the car, started to drive down, and it was all right. And then five minutes later, I kind of noticed that the brakes were a little bit weird. So I was basically standing on them, and the car wasn't really slowing down all that much. And in hindsight, this is the point where I should have turned around and gone back. But I was like, nope, I can drive this car. So I continued. And then a couple of minutes later, the brakes just stopped working altogether. And what you have to know is like the road down Mauna Kea is it's very steep. It's quite long and there are a lot of curves in there. So this is not the kind of road that you want to drive down very quickly. Uh, so I was going faster and faster and I was going past some cattle gates and I saw the next curve coming up. I was like, I'm not going to make that curve. Um, so in a very desperate attempt, I kind of drove off the road and there was like a small rise on the side. So I drove up that rise and pushed the handbrake button, which is, it was one of those hybrid, weird hybrid cars. So the handbrake is like a button you have to push. So thankfully the car stopped um, and unfortunately the weather was really bad and reception up there is also really bad. So I got out, it was very foggy. I could just hear like the cows in the background and I could already like envision my skeleton somewhere on a mountain in Hawaii, the only person to ever freeze to death on Hawaii. Um, for those emergencies right there is a support astronomer that you call and fortunately that support astronomer mine happened to be outside of reception range for that like hour when it happened. So I spent the last couple of pounds I had on my phone to look up a phone number for the accommodations. And the only one I could find was the kitchen staff. So I phoned the cook in the accommodation and he was really super sweet. And they sent down a van to bring me back up. And then later he actually drove me down into the town. So managed to hold it together. And then I really, really embarrassed myself during the last day. Well, yeah, you know, one of the drawbacks of going for observing runs, but it doesn't always happen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why okay, we have the, the headquarters now down the mountain, you know, because that these things happen way too many times, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Yeah, thank you, Francie. So today she will talk about cosmic dust and, and supernovae, which is the, the topic of, of her PhD. All right, and before we start, uh, have you seen the new logo? So I said new format, we have a new logo. 
Uh, you can also watch it down the video. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. And also because we have a kind of time lag between uh, here and, and YouTube, so it's about 20 seconds. If you can already uh, start asking questions on the chat uh, about one minute, uh, you know, about 15 minutes into the presentation, uh, that will help us uh, to get everything in time. And then uh, you can basically ask all your questions to Francie, uh, which will be, of course, very happy to answer, uh, I guess. And uh, yeah, so just ask and we will be there. And uh, I think Francie, you can start now. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know when it works. Can you see that? Yes, it's perfect. Awesome. So if you can't see that, um, there might be an issue with your eyesight. And in that case, I do recommend driving to a nice little castle nearby. Only 30 minutes. I'm sure there's some nice ones around. Okay, enough snack. Uh, let's talk about science a little bit. So as already mentioned, I'm going to talk about cosmic dust and supernova explosions today. And I've kind of divided this talk into three parts. We're first going to look at cosmic dust in general and why it's important. Then we are going to have a look at exploding stars and how, what they like, what connects them to the cosmic dust. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the current state of the research. And in particular, uh, particularly, I hope that I can give you a short introduction to numerical astrophysics. So you have an idea what numerical astrophysicists actually do to solve questions in science. So part one, let's look at the dust in the universe. And we're going to go back in time here a little bit to William Herschel and Caroline Herschel. Now, of course, these people are household names in astronomy, famous for a lot of very important contributions. I want to focus on one specific contribution here. Uh, and that was an observation taken on the 21st of May, 1784. And on that day, William Herschel pointed his telescope into the sky and he saw something that was a little bit strange. In his logbook, he wrote down, it seems as if there were a perforation or hole in the body of the scorpion. So Herschel saw an area in the sky that was dark, even though there should be stars. So it was a large area where there was just no light coming from it. Now, at that time, it didn't really create that many waves. Uh, but a couple of years later, Caroline Herschel wrote a letter to William's son, John. And she asked John to please have a look and see if he could find those holes in the sky that William had observed and maybe even figure out what they were. And John did that. And a lot of other ob observers did that as well. And from that moment onwards, basically, we realized that there were these areas in space where it seems there's no light coming from them. Now. Today, we know these are not actually holes in the sky. Today, we know these are dark nebulae. And I've got one example here. This is Bernard 68, probably one of the most famous dark nebulae. And Bernard 68, as you can see, it wouldn't be too ridic uh, ridiculous to assume that this might be a hole in the sky, right? You've got basically nothing going on there in the middle. And then the stars go from white to yellow to orange to red, and then they just disappear there at the edges. Um, now, today we know, of course, these are not holes in the sky. These are actually clouds uh, consisting of gas and dust. And if we look at this, not in the optical light, so not with our eyes or as Herschel did with his telescope, but in the infrared light, we can actually see that there's something behind it. So the stars continue there in the background. We just can't see them because of this dust and gas. So from that, we learn that Dust likes to absorb the optical light, so it likes to swallow it up and not give it back, so we can't see it with our eyes. But if we go to the infrared, we can see inside the dust clouds and we can see what's behind it. So that's going to be important if we actually want to observe dust. We need infrared telescope. The optical ones won't help us here. Now, why do we care about dust, apart from the fact that the dust is sometimes in front of stuff that we actually want to see? And that's a question I get asked quite often, because generally when you t tell people that you do astrophysics, they're quite excited, and that excitement just vanishes when you tell them that you do cosmic dust. And that's a bit of a shame, because dust, cosmic dust is not only interesting, it's also very, very important for basically everything that we have around us. So I hope in the next couple of slides I can convince you that cosmic dust is not something to be bored of. Uh, uh, bored of. So let's start with galaxy evolution. Now, galaxies are some of the largest structures we can observe, observe in the universe, consisting of dark matter, which of course we can't see, but also stars, gas, dust, and so on and so forth. And these gas clouds inside the galaxy have a direct effect on the evolution of our galaxy. 
And in those gas clouds, we've got hydrogen and helium and a couple of other heavier elements. And what the dust in these gas clouds likes to do is it likes to absorb these heavy elements. It likes to deplete the gas of the heavy elements. And that changes the chemical composition of the gas and therefore the galaxy. And that has an effect on how the galaxy will then evolve. Now, what dust also likes to do is it likes to absorb light. And that brings us to point two here, star formation. Now, I don't really want to go into too much detail here, but stars form in these molecular clouds. Here we've got the beautiful pillars of creation. And when these molecular clouds collapse, they can, under the right circumstances, form stars. And they collapse when they cool, and they cool because of cosmic dust. So cosmic dust can trigger the formation of new stellar systems. And then once we form the stellar systems, the remaining gas and the remaining dust that wasn't used to form the star forms what we call a protoplanetary disk around the young star. And in these protoplanetary disks, this is where we then form uh, planets, comets, asteroids, moons, and so on and so forth. So cosmic dust is not only important for like the very big stuff like galaxies, it is absolutely essential for the very small stuff as well, like planets and the life that we have on our planet. So it's really not wrong to say that we're all a little bit cosmic dusty. Uh, right. Now, when we want to observe cosmic dust, we have several options here, depending on what we want to do. The first thing we can do is we can actually collect the dust and look at it under a microscope. For that, we can either go into the Antarctic and collect the dust in the ice. We can build probes, uh, send them into space and fly behind comets and then collect the dust from there. Or more recently, uh, this is the higher also a two mission on the right, we can send up uh, an instrument that uh, fired a projectile into an asteroid and some dust flew off as a result of that and Hayabusa 2 then collected that dust and is now currently on the way back to Earth. So hopefully by the end of this year, we will have a little bit of asteroid dust to look at. Now, when we do this, what we learn about is uh, the composition of the dust and the material at the time when our Earth was forming. So we learn about our immediate past. If we want to learn about something that's a bit further away, say uh, another region of the Milky Way, or maybe even a completely different galaxy, uh, we can't use instruments like these, of course, and we can't go there, it's just too far away. So instead we use telescopes. And as I already mentioned, we have to use the infrared telescopes because the information that we want will be in the infrared. Now we can put those telescopes on mountains uh, on the ground, uh, like in the left picture here. We can put them onto planes and fly up a little bit, that's better. And then finally, we can also put them into space. That, that's of course the best. And with that, we can actually learn about the dust in far away places in our universe, which is gonna be important later on. Now, the origin of cosmic dust, and this is the first time that we actually hit an area where we're not quite certain uh, what the answers are to some of the questions we might be asking. Now, what I'm gonna show you on this slide is the state of research about 15 to 20 years ago. And then the rest of the talk, we're gonna spend learning about what we have learned since then in the last 15 to 20 years. Now, 15 to 20 years ago, uh, people were quite happy believing that most of the cosmic dust comes from asymptotic, asymptotic giant brown stars, like this one here, for example, which is a Wolf Rayet star. Now, these stars are very old. They are heading towards the end of their lives, basically. They're very extended. And in these outer regions of the star, the conditions are perfect for dust formation. And what's also important here is that these stars have very strong stellar winds. So those, those winds can carry out the dust and so enrich the universe around them. So the dust is incorporated into the next generation of stars or the next generation of planets. Now, people were quite happy with this for quite a long time until astronomers took pictures of objects that are very, very far away. And when we do that, we take pictures of things that are very, very young. And one of these objects is this one. So this is a galaxy that was observed at redshift 8.38. Now redshift is a number we use instead of light years to describe distance, but also age. And this galaxy with redshift 8.38 is less than a billion years old. So that's really, really young. So that's amazing in, in, in of itself that we can watch something like this. But what's really special about this galaxy and other galaxies like it that we have observed since is that it's got a lot of dust in it. So this specific galaxy has dust masses of 10 to the power of six solar, ma solar masses. And that's just a lot. Might not be a lot for the Milky Way, but for a galaxy less than a billion years old, that is a lot. 
You have to consider here that the HEB stars, they take more than a billion years to evolve. So that galaxy right there shouldn't have a lot of stars able to produce dust at this point in time. So the big question ever since then uh, is the same question that I'm asking myself every time I have to clean my flat. And this is, where does all this dust come from? And at this point, I want to stop talking about dust for a little bit. And then I want to move on to part two, when stars explode. And then hopefully we're going to figure out what exploding stars have to do with the cosmic dust. Now, a very, very short um, introduction to the life cycle of massive stars. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail here. So just very briefly, we start out with a main sequence star. That's a star that's burning hydrogen in its core. And once the hydrogen runs out, further fusion processes can be triggered if the star is very massive. And then it becomes what we call a red supergiant. Now, this fusion goes on and on and on until we reach the final element, namely iron, and then the fusion stops. And what happens then is a supernova explosion. And given the right circumstances during that explosion, we can then get the end results, meaning a neutron star in the middle of it. That's the collapsing uh, core of the star, basically, and the supernova remnant. And the supernova remnant, that's the material around the core that was ejected as the star blew up. And it's those supernova remnants that I want to spend some time talking about. Now, supernova remnants, first of all, they're super, super pretty. So I've picked out a couple of examples here of different types of supernova remnants. And the other interesting thing, and the reason why these uh, supernova remnants are in my talk, is that for some time now, people have suggested that these supernova remnants might be might be great environments for dust formation. We've got the right temperature, we've got the right density, we've got the right elements in there. So a couple of years ago, about 10 years or so ago, people have started to look at supernova remnants in more detail. In particular, they were trying to look for the dust. And of course, they found some dust in there, otherwise it wouldn't be in this talk. So ever since then, uh, some of the astrophysicists looking for dust have kind of turned away from the HEB stars, and we're now looking more at the supernova explosions. Right now, we've got observations of a lot of young supernova remnants, so a couple of days, maybe even hours after they blew up, to figure out when dust starts forming. And we do have follow-up observations of old supernova remnants to figure out if the dust mass has changed in the last 10, 15 years or so. Um, and we've actually found that most supernovae have quite a lot of dust in them. Supernova remnants have quite a lot of dust in them. We can actually find some that have up to one solar mass of dust, and that's quite a lot. So if every supernovae would produce that amount of dust, we could explain the dust in the early universe. Fortunately, of course, that is not the end of the story because creating the dust is not everything, you actually have to retain it. And this is where it gets complicated. So uh, this is a picture, uh, a very simplified picture of what a supernova remnant looks like just after the star has blew up, basically. So we've got the circumstellar material around it. This is the material that was thrown out by the star shortly before it blew up. And then we've got the supernova remnant, which is the stuff that was thrown out during the explosion, which is now expanding outwards. And inside the remnant, we have these dense and dusty clumps. This is where the dust has formed and where the dust is currently continuing to grow. And the dust is quite happy right now, just moving outwards, no idea what's coming for it. Because as time progresses and the remnant continues to expand, at some point it will hit the circumstellar material. And when it does, we're going to form shocks. Now, one shock we're going to form is the so-called forward shock. This is the shock moving outwards like a snowplow, basically. And then the second shock that we're forming is the reverse shock. And that's the one that's giving me headaches. So the reverse shock is not actually moving backwards. It's still moving outwards, but it's moving outwards slower than all the other stuff. So at some point, our dense and dusty clump down here with our happy dust grains will hit the reverse shock. And when that happens, the gas and the dust is accelerated, heated and compressed. And all of that can lead to dust destruction. So right now, the question is not, do supernova remnants produce dust? We know that. The question is, do supernovae actually end up destroying all the dust they have created? And this brings us to part three, dusty bits and bites. Now, unfortunately, we cannot solve this with telescopes, but we can do it with computers. So before I show you a little bit about our current estimates of the dust survival rates, I want to walk you through what we do in numerical astrophysics to build a computer model such as this to answer this question.
So step one is we have to understand what the problem is. And luckily, we've already done this, right? We know what we want to know. We want to figure out if we put a certain amount of dust inside a supernova remnant, how much of that dust can survive the passage of the reverse shock. Now, the picture that I have here is CAS-A, which is probably one of the best studied supernova remnants and the one I use as uh, input parameters for my simulations. And it looks quite roundish here, right, in this 2D projection. But unfortunately, if you look at it in 3D like this, uh, it looks quite different and it looks quite horrible and quite complicated, really. Now, a, a setup such as this uh, is too complex for our computers. They can't do that. And that brings us to step two. We need to simplify this. And this is what our simplified model looks like. So this is basically a reduction to the absolute essentials of the issue. So we have on the right hand side, this is the pre-shock region. This is the unshocked ejector where our dusty clump is. And on the left hand side, we have the shocked uh, region of the ejector. And then the shock, those are the red lines, is moving from left to right. And then in the computer, we can study what happens to the gas and the dust in the clump when this shock hits. Now, once we've set up our simplified model, we can move on to the coding. So we do a lot of coding and by coding, we put in the physics. So we tell the gas and the dust how to move. And we also tell the dust under which condition, conditions it gets destroyed. That takes quite some time. And what takes even longer is testing the code in the end, right? You wanna make sure that what you get out is not absolute rubbish. So you have to test a lot to make sure that the code actually does what it's supposed to be doing. And once we've done that, we can finally move on to simulations. Now we can't do those on laptops, they're not powerful enough. We have to move on to high performance clusters. I've got a couple of pictures here, some from the high performance cluster in Stuttgart, which I used to work with, and one uh, of the Darac systems, which I use right now. Now these high performance clusters are basically a lot of computers all hooked up together so we can use them simultaneously, which reduces the amount of time that we spend on simulations. And once they're done, we can download them and analyze them, and then you get something like this. So these are a couple of screenshots from a simulation. You see the clumpy in the upper left corner that's being hit by the shock. And as time progresses down to the bottom right, you can see that the clump is basically torn apart by the shock interaction, forming some kind of butterfly structure at the end. And this is where it gets dangerous for the dust, because then the dust is subjected to the turbulences and the hot gas around it, which can trigger the dust destruction. Now, in those two final slides, I want to show you what we know right now about the survivability of the dust grains in the remnant. Now, the first plot is not going to look good, but the second one's going to be a bit better. So on this first plot, uh, we have on the x-axis the time going from zero to 60 years in our simulations. And on the y-axis, you've got the dust survival rate going from zero to 100%. And we're going to start out, obviously, with 100% of dust. And if we include dust destruction processes, we get this curve here. So this is quite bad. Within 60 years, we're down to 10% of dust survival. So this is really horrible news for us. If every supernovae would only be able to retain 10% of the dust that it created, that probably wouldn't be enough to explain the dust that we find in the early universe. But as I mentioned, this is not the end of the story here. There are a couple of things we haven't considered yet. One thing we haven't considered yet is magnetic fields, which is something that we're working on right now. And another thing is growing the dust grain. And we've done this early in the year. And this is this plot here, a little bit more complicated. Uh, again, you've got the time on the x-axis going from zero to 60 years. And on the y-axis, I've changed the name here a little bit. So on the y-axis, you've basically got the rate of mass loss or mass gain of the dust. So the higher the number is, the more mass you either gain or lose. And the red curve here is dust destruction. And that really peaks when the shock hits the clump. So we're losing a lot of dust there. But what's interesting here is this region, the region between 40 and 60 years, because there the black curve, which is the growth rate, is above the red curve, which is the destruction rate. So between 50, uh, 40 and 60 years, we're actually creating more dust than we're destroying. And now you have to consider that this little dust grain in the remnant takes about 10,000 years to go from the supernova remnant into the interstellar medium. So a lot can happen in 10,000 years. And we now need to run these simulations longer to figure out if the dust grain continues to grow during those 10,000 years and if that could account for some of the material that we've destroyed uh, earlier. But again, this is like 
preliminary and we're still doing research there. So this will probably change within the next couple of years. Right now, though, we can say that with the settings that we have, um, we can get up to dust survival rates of about 40%, which is better than the 10% we had earlier. But again, a lot of research still happening. Okay, so quick summary here at the end. Uh, cosmic dust is absolutely essential for the formation and evolution of galaxies, stars, planets, and life itself. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't really know where the cosmic dust in the early universe is coming from. Now, supernova remnants have been suggested as alternative dust producers, and we have indeed found dust in them. But unfortunately, they also destroy a lot of dust. Currently, we believe that up to 40% of the dust might survive, but again, a lot will change in the next couple of years. And that is me done. I want to thank you very much for listening. I hope it was enjoyable. And if you do have any questions, I'd be super happy to answer them. Great, excellent. Thank you, Francie. Um, so before we go on to questions, perhaps we had uh, during the weeks, uh, we always have questions that are posted on Twitter. Uh, and we will now get the answers, or maybe we'll discuss the answers with the speaker, perhaps. Yeah, sure. Um, let, let me sh just show my screen. All right. Oop. OK, C can you see my screen? Is that... Yep. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, so the first, the first question uh, is actually related to one of the pictures that you showed, uh, Francisco. Um, which is a picture of the Crab Nebula. And so the question was, uh, what resides at the center of the Crab Nebula? So is it a black hole? Is it a pulsar? Is it a star? Or is there just nothing just vanished? Um, so maybe you can answer that question, uh, Fran Francisca? Sure. So at the center of the supernova remnant, we have a pulsar, uh, which is basically a neutron star that is very fast rotating, and it's got a magnetic field. OK, amazing. OK, so the answer was a pulsar. I, I got it right. Um, and then we had uh, two other questions, uh, which, was, which were more related to uh, dusty stuff in the universe. Um, so uh, here are two pictures from the Hubble Space Telescopes. Um, so what are the names of these objects? So on the top, uh, among the possible answers were the fingers of God, the pillars of creation, and the towers of life. Uh, and so in, in this case, uh, do, do you know the answer, Francisca, to both of the, the questions? Can you move to the other slide? Oh, yeah, Is can that? you make uh, the slide bigger? Uh, it's still on the first one. OK, is it, is it good? Uh, if you no. click on the second one, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm OK, wait, wait, sorry. No worries. That's the usual one, please. Yeah, OK. Is it good? Yeah. It looks OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so the question was, uh, what, what is this picture on the top right? Uh, and so the answer here is the pillars of creation. Uh, so that's, but then a, maybe a bit more tricky. What is the picture on the bottom right? Is it the fountain of life, the eagle clothes, or the mystic mountain? So I think it's the mystic mountain, hopefully. Oh, yeah, thank, that's, thank that's God. The mystic mountain, yeah. Didn't that's embarrass good. myself. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's the, the right the, the right answer. Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Um, so maybe we could uh, take questions either from Twitter or from YouTube. Or uh, maybe uh, the panel has some questions. Yeah, maybe I can ask a question, Francie. Um, I was wondering whether uh, magnetic fields can have a role in this process of dust destruction, production, and, and so on. That is a really, really good question, mainly because I've prepared a slide for that. So let me just uh, go back uh, to my slides. Can you see that? Hopefully. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, let me just go to two slides down. Um, so magnetic fields can do two things. So first of all, they can change the way the clump evolves. So in these pictures on the top, you can see like the top of those blots, that is the clump evolution with a magnetic field. And on the bottom, you see the clump evolution without a magnetic field. And it's a little bit hard to see, but Basically, what happens is that depending on the orientation of the magnetic fields, the field lines can kind of push onto the clump and make sure that it 
it's not torn apart as much as a clump without a magnetic field, which could protect the dust grains, um, depending on how, many, how much of the turbulence is actually introduced into it later on. So that's one thing that happens, but that really depends on the orientation of the magnetic field uh, in relation to the clump orientation. And then the second thing, that's a little picture there at the bottom where we have that little dust grain and it spirals around that red arrow. That's meant to be a magnetic field line. So if the grain is charged, it can get trapped by magnetic field lines and spiral around them. So it kind of keeps bouncing around, which again can be either good or bad, depending on whether it gets trapped in a nice area, nice environment, or whether it gets trapped in a bad environment. So uh, this is what we're currently working on. And uh, as of now, I have no idea whether magnetic fields will improve the survival chances of the dust or, uh, or not. Uh, I think that's something that we really need to do the simulations for to figure out. Right, so we have questions from the chat. I will start. Um, so the first one is, what is a kilonova? And how is it different from a supernova? Oh God, um, basically, so, right. So I didn't cover this at all. What I've been talking about are so-called core collapse supernovae. And they're basically, they're resulting from the natural evolution path uh, path of a very massive star. And when I say very massive star, I mean like eight solar masses or more massive. That's like the natural way to get a star to explode. And then depending on how like heavy the star is, you can get special cases of these explosions. Like there are cases where the star doesn't even reach the, uh, the iron in the core, where it's just so massive that it triggers a supernova explosion even before that. And that re results in like these very, very energetic supernovae that have more energy than the normal ones. But then um, on top of that, there's also the type of supernovae that I haven't talked about at all, and that's the type 1A supernovae. So those don't come naturally at the end of the life of a star. Those come either from mass transfer on a white dwarf or from two colliding white dwarfs. And they're quite different. And we actually, as far as I know, we actually haven't found any dust in some of these. So basically, uh, the normal supernovae, they come from the evolution of very massive stars. And then when you add mass on top of that, you can trigger certain chemical reactions that make them like really, really big. And that's where you get like those pair instability in kilo and all of that. I hope that was enough. I'm not an expert on kilo supernovae, I have to say. Thank you, Franzi. We have another question. Um, what elements are created when a star explodes as a supernova? That's a great point, and I do have a slide for that as well, don't I? Let me just um, find that, because that's really super interesting. Um, hopefully I have a slide. Yes, I do have a slide. OK, uh, let's go to this real quick. Right. So what you see here is uh, the periodic table, a little bit different than you would normally see it. So the color of these elements kind of tells you where these elements were created. And what we need to focus on here is the green elements here, the exploding massive stars. So I've blackened out the others a little bit, so you can only see the ones that I actually generated in uh, those supernovae. So there are a lot of them, so I don't want to go over all of them. But uh, what's very interesting is like these ones here, and down here also. Um, and those are, and these ones here as well, those are basically exclusively generated in these supernovae. So if we wouldn't have supernovae, we probably wouldn't get them, at least not in the abundances that we have today. And that would probably mean um, that we wouldn't have life the way that we have it right now. For example, iron here, uh, this is one of the elements um, that is created at the center of these exploding stars. And we need iron basically for living, you know, the iron in our blood. So if we wouldn't have iron, that wouldn't be very good for us. So we produce, we're producing quite a lot of these elements in exploding stars, some of them exclusive, exclusively in them. All right, so an interesting question. Someone's asking, Someone's, I think we never had this. It's absolutely great. Someone's asking to see your code. Uh, and it's actually great they ask this because I know uh, you share your presentations and, and part of your code, right? Um. Uh, so I'm on the wrong computer. 
Um, that that's the issue. So so I do my coding on a Linux one, and I'm on a Windows one right now because this has got a working camera. Let me just check if. Um, so I'm not going to show you like line for line my code because it's not done yet, right? It's horrible. How many lines? Just yeah. a lot of lines. So what I can do is I can I can scroll through a little bit of that. So let let's see if I can do that. Um, right. Don't judge my coding, please. Don't judge. Okay, here we go. Can you see my browser? Yes. Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is my GitHub repository. This is where I back up all my stuff, uh, including my code. And what's important here is this repository here is called Dusty Astrobear. So I haven't mentioned this yet, but we haven't written all of the code ourselves. We use an MHD code called Astrobear. And I've now added the dust to this uh, code. So this is not going to be the whole code. Uh, I've got that on, on a different repository. It's, it's complicated. Uh, in this one, I've basically got all the files that I had to change uh, for to include the dust. So let's go to sources. So these are all the files that already, or most of the files that are already in the Astro Bear code with a couple of them that I've added. So I've added everything that's in this folder here. And you can see there's like one file here. This is just general dust stuff. And then you've got different files that handle different things like dust detection handles moving the dust around in the domain. Uh, you've got dust collision that handles the dust collisions between the grains. And I can show you something here because this is the one thing that I'm actually kind of proud of. Uh, if I can find it, where is it? Is it in hyperbolics? Yes, there it is. So there's this one file I've been working on this for quite some time. This is called a Riemann solver. Now a Riemann solver, again, not going into too much details here, uh, in your code, you have to solve the sh shock structure at every interface. And in a grid-based code, you've got a lot of interfaces in there. So you solve these, um, inter these shock evolutions about depending on how many grid cells you have, maybe 400 times in one direction and 300 times in the other direction. And to make sure that you resolve um, these shocks correctly, you need something called a Riemann solver. So I also hope that my commit messages weren't too telling right now, because sometimes I write rubbish in them. So don't look at my commit messages. Uh, so this is what code looks like. This is just a really, really long file that handles this calculation of the shock structure. And um, again, there's there's a lot going on there. You have to do different, so depending on how precise you wanna be, you can test different solvers. So I don't know if I can find this right now. Uh, so for example, this solver here is called HLL. This is Hartman, Lee and Lacks. This is basically the standard solver that you would solve. This is quite good, but not perfect. So I've added my dust to that. And then there's a better solver. This is the one that I would use for production runs. And this is called, where's the end of it? This is called this one, HLLC, which resolves a couple more shock structures in your code. And as you can see, this is quite a lot of code. So this is the beginning of it, right? This is where we start. And when we go down, 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 and down, and down, and up to here. So it's quite a lot of code in there. Uh, I don't know how many lines in total. Um, I converted it once to a PDF and it was, it was approaching like 100 pages, but that was a couple of months ago. So I, I don't know. At some point I will check, but this is still very much uh, a work in progress. So I, I really don't know how many lines of code right now. Okay, I'm gonna hide this now, just in case I have embarrassing comments somewhere in the code. I hope that helped in some way. I really don't know how to show code. So AstroBear is not public, right? So AstroBear is public. Uh, the base code is public, not what I'm doing. Um, what I'm doing will hopefully, uh, I have a, I, so I'm part of the AstroBear developer team. Uh, and I guess once I'm done, it will be included in AstroBear and then it will be made public. Uh, if it's not included in the source code itself, I will make it public on my GitHub. But I will not do that until it's like tested and my thesis has been published. Uh, but AstroBear is public. Uh, you can just Google that. Uh, it's just Astro and then Bear. Uh, I think you need to write an email to the development group because they want to keep track on like who's using their code and for what. Uh, but it is, you can get it. You don't have to like be part of the group. Do you maybe for, for so there is someone interested there, an XIT developer, if do you know of any MHD or maybe just uh, illus maybe Illustris, maybe Corentin, you know, as well, uh, some, you know, some 
some big collaborations are making the code public? Yeah, so um, if you're interested in, in codes used in astrophysics, you can, uh, for example, take a look at uh, RAMSYS, uh, just as the, uh, uh, the well, just, just as RAMSYS, which is an open source code. Uh, and I just checked it, I checked it out, and it's uh, 700,000 lines. So you probably don't want to read each, of, each one of them, but you can find the, the source code online. Everything is free. Uh, and m most of the codes, you can actually have access to the code pretty easily. Um, if you know who to ask or where to look for. But there, there is a strong tradition in astrophysics to have kind of open source codes or at least uh, accessible codes if you ask them, contrary to some other communities. There's also um, Pluto and Enso, which uh, are MHD codes that I've worked with before. And I found particularly Pluto is really nice for people who haven't done MHD before and want to get started. But like MHD codes, that that's just, um, do I have my book here some? Maybe I can show you. Do I have my book? Yeah, so this book here, whoops, something fell down. This nice book here, right? This is a book just on Riemann solvers. So the code that I've just showed you, this is the theory necessary to develop this code. So you can imagine how much goes into building an MHD code. Uh, but usually when you start out with an MHD code, you don't go straight into adding new routines and modifying Riemann solvers and all of that. You start working with small routines and you start modifying them. And both Pluto and Enzo, in my experience, are very good for just getting a feel of how they generally look, these MHD codes, and then getting started. And then you can also uh, look at uh, SPH codes, which is basically also hydrodynamics, but instead of having like a grid based system, you have a particle based system, which is sometimes a bit better to understand, I feel, uh, but I haven't really worked with one that's publicly available, so I can't give any recommendations there. If you're interested in that, uh, I'll, I'll post the link in the, uh, in the chat. Great. So we can move on to the next question. Somebody is asking um, if Betelgeuse uh, will go supernova soon. That would be so nice, wouldn't it? Um, so we've all been basically sitting there like this the entire winter break, just hoping it would finally, finally die. Um, but the moment at the moment i don't think it will so it was dimming for some time and when when that happens uh people kind of suspected it might go off because shortly before it explodes right it produces a lot of dust in these outer hulls and that can dim the light that you receive from it so people thought maybe this is a sign it's gonna blow up but as it turns out or oh, we've known that before uh, beetlejuice actually has variability in its light curve naturally apparently for the past I don't know, a couple of decades. So what we've seen, unfortunately, is just a very extreme dip in, in the brightness of it. Um, it's now going up again. It's been going up steadily, I think, for a while now. Um, so right now, I don't think it, it's going to go up. It's going to go up in the next couple of thousand years. But I think the likelihood that we will see or we will experience that at the moment is unfortunately um, quite low. All right. maybe. Very quickly, we have two final questions. Uh, one is, um, do you consider the pulsar jets? Um, and the second is- Sorry, could you the... repeat the first one? Yeah, sorry. So the first question is, what is the uh, pulsar jet? Is, is it important to be, so you have your pulsar at the inter- at Oh, the... right, right. Um, so the remnant that I'm looking at doesn't actually have like uh, uh, any kind of pulsar that I need to consider there. Um, I, I'm not considering it right now because our assumption is when we simplify the model right on that slide, our assumption is that we've included everything that is dominating the environment in that quite small region that we're simulating. Uh, and we're assuming that whatever is at the center of the supernova remnant, wh whether that's a pulsar or a neutron star, uh, at the moment doesn't have an effect on something that's quite far out, far out in the ejecta. So no, at the moment, we're not considering that. Right, and finally, I think to wrap up, someone's asking, um, what are you gonna do after your PhD? Well, it depends on the job market. Uh, I would like to stay in astronomy, but you know, uh, there are not a lot of jobs out there. So ask me again in a year or maybe 10 years, hopefully I'll know then. 
So if someone is running a private institute, that they should just call you, right? Yeah, it's just I'm just going to build my new SpaceX. You know, I've got the Elon Musk hype going, and then. All right. So, will you be hunting down all the satellites so that you know we can get access to the skies again? That would. Be I could amazing. just like build a like a competitor to Elon Musk, and my satellites will shoot down his satellites, and it's just going to be like a space war thingy, like for it's, science, it's for astronomy, Star Wars. Right, right. That would be amazing. Um, okay, thank you very much, Francie. Thank you very much, everyone who's been there tonight. Um, please, you know, subscribe to the channel if you want to uh, get uh, updates on the next talk. So actually, we already have a time and date for the next talk. Um, I share this. Uh, so yeah, next week uh, another talk by another uh, great researcher. Uh, this time, half from UCL, half from Imperial College. Uh, so we're staying two feet in London, and we're going to talk about neutrino uh, and especially how we can weigh uh, this particle that is basically super light. And the problem is when, when a particle is, is light is it does not interact with anything. And so it does not interact with any scale that you could have. Um, so the question is how you can weigh uh, the, the, the lightest particle in the universe. And the answer is use the whole universe. And Arthur will tell us more about this. Um, so if you're watching this video uh, after the, uh, the stream time, there will be a link at the end. There will be links also to, to subscribe. And if you want more Astronomy on Tap, uh, we have more videos on the channel. Uh, you can also look at different Astronomy on Tap. They are in the UK, in the US, uh, most of them in English. So if you want more Astro, there is always this. And of course, tonight, I suppose that many of you in two hours will be looking at the sky uh, if there is a launch or not. Um, on this, I think we can say bye-bye and uh, we will see you in two weeks. Bye. 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 Thank you.